Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to the second in a series of videos where I'm going to be teaching you how to play Perseverance Castaway Chronicles, a 1-4 player competitive game in which you and the other players find yourself stranded on a mysterious island, inhabited by dinosaurs and with its own secrets to tell. Episode 2 is set a few months after Episode 1 and the town of Perseverance has become a self-sustaining growing community. The wall surrounding the town is complete, preventing the relentless dino attacks. It's now time to look beyond the safety of the town for opportunities to expand and find answers to the mysteries of the island. The threat of the roaming dinosaurs, however, cannot be ignored, especially the newly discovered shieldhead species. Establish camps, outposts and watchtowers to help protect your people as you explore deeper into the wilderness. In this video, I'm going to be explaining how to set up and then play Episode 2 with 2-4 two to four players. If you haven't seen my video on how to play Episode 1, you will need to watch that one first, as many of the core rules of the game I have already covered in that video, and I won't be repeating them here. For the solo game, first watch this video and then refer to the supplemental rulebook, or check out my channel in case I've done a solo playthrough. A huge thank you to Mind Clash Games for commissioning this video, and if you find this video useful and want to support the channel directly to help me make more videos like this, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. The full list of components you need for Episode 2 is listed on the first few pages of the rulebook. Some components you used in Episode 1 are not used in Episode 2. For example, the traps, walls, the combat rewards board, etc. Only take the components you need for Episode 2. Like in the previous video, I'm using the components that come with the deluxe version of the game, which includes the minis for the soldiers, the dinosaurs, and these rather squishy globaries. If you have the standard version of the game, just substitute those with the standard components. Place the main board in the middle of the playing area. Use the correct side of the board depending on your play count, as shown in the bottom right of the board. The board is divided into five zones. The four zones at the bottom of the board are known as the city zones, which contain die spaces and effects. They work like the settlement areas in Episode 1. The fifth zone, the Discovery Zone, is where you'll be sending adventuring parties out to explore, clear space for expansion, and to drive off the dinos. Separate the adventure cards into four decks based on their type. Starter, Plains, Canyon, and Temple. Shuffle each deck separately and set the Starter and Temple cards aside. Place the Plains and the Canyon decks face up nearby, and then move the top card of each deck next to the deck so that there are two cards of each type visible. Separate the challenge cards by type, shuffle each deck separately, and place them face down near the adventure cards, along with the rally marker and the threat die. Place the assembly board nearby. Use this side of the board when playing with two players, or this side of the board when playing with three and four players. Take the assembly scoring tiles corresponding to the player count. These two tiles for a two-player game, these three tiles for a three-player game, and flip these tiles over for a four-player game. Place them on the spaces on the assembly board in order from left to right. Place the assembly reward tiles below the assembly board. There are five of them, one for each zone. Place four of the five officer tiles at random below the main board, one for each zone, and then the fifth officer next to the discovery zone. For your first game, it's recommended to place them as follows. Sustenance, the chief mate. Military, chief of security. Expansion, chief steward. Construction, chief engineer. And place the captain in the discovery zone. Place the food, scrap, story, island resources and globaries in a supply nearby. Place all three types of dino nearby in their own supply. Separate the dino attack cards by type, shuffle each deck separately and place them face down nearby. Place the outpost board near the main board. Shuffle the outpost tiles and place them as a face down stack on the board as shown. Then take the top three tiles from the stack and place them face up on the spaces like this. To set up the discovery zone, place each map tile hex on its indicated space. The C1 tile is placed on space C1 and so on. For your first game, use the A side of the tiles, which is an easier map layout. For later games, you can place the tiles a random side up, or you can place them all with the B side if you want a harder map layout. Note that in the first printing of the game, there is an unfortunate error made on this tile. The tile should be C7A, but it's misprinted as C3B. If you're randomly choosing which side each tile is showing, you may end up with two temple spaces. If this happens, choose one of them to be the actual temple space and flip the other one over. Place the temple miniature on the temple space. A temple in the jungle? So someone or something has been here before. On each dino space with the setup icon, which is an orange arrow, place the corresponding dino. This includes the spaces on the outside of the map itself. Each player chooses one of the four aspiring leaders and takes the following components. 
the player board, the leader miniature and the follower dial set to 10 followers. Each player chooses a player colour and takes the following components in that colour, placing them into their personal supply. 12 settlements, 6 camps, 5 dice, 5 light soldiers, 5 heavy soldiers and all 25 influence cubes. Attach the leader base cap in your colour to your leader miniature and place it on your player board. Place your valour token on space 1 of your valour track and place your vote token and your permanent vote token on the zero space of your vote track. Also take three watchtowers, one adventure stage marker and one breach token. The top right of your player board shows what you start the game with. Take all of these assets from the supply and place them on your player board. Then move one light soldier from your personal supply onto your player board. Each player takes the player aid for their leader with the turn sequence on one side and a summary of dino combat and final scoring on the back. There's also another player aid with dino attacks on one side and assemblies on the other. Create the dice pool as you did in episode 1, taking one die per player in the game and then adding to it a number of neutral dice based on the number of players. 9 dice for a 2 player game, 8 dice for a 3 player game and 10 dice for a 4 player game. And like in episode 1, if playing with 2 players, add in 2 player dice of an unused player colour into the pool to represent the dissenters. Take the starter and temple adventure decks and deal one card at random from each deck to each player, face down. You can look at your own cards, but keep them hidden from the other players. The player who has most recently been on a nature adventure is the first player, and play proceeds clockwise. But before the game starts, each player begins the game by placing one of their settlements on the board. Just like in episode 1, starting with the last player and proceeding counterclockwise, each player places one settlement onto the bottommost settlement space in a city zone of their choice. Or, if the discovery zone is chosen, instead of placing a settlement, a camp is placed on the camp space of the cleared area on the left side of the board. As usual, players must choose different zones to start in. And each player places one influence cube on the leftmost empty influence space of the officer assigned to the zone where they placed a settlement. As an additional setup bonus for episode 2, each player receives the bonus for the officer where they placed a cube. For your first game, it's recommended to place your starting settlements and influence as shown in the rulebook. In a two-player game, add settlements and influence for the dissenters just as you did in episode 1, adding one settlement in each city zone not chosen by the players, and then an additional settlement in one of them chosen at random. If neither of the players chose to start in the discovery zone, the dissenters do not build a camp there. And also add dissenter influence cubes as you did in episode 1. Two cubes on the officer assigned to the zone with two dissenter settlements and one on each of the other four officers, including the one in the discovery zone. The bottom half of each player board depicts six perks for each of the five officers, divided into tier 1, 2 and 3. At this point in setup, each player chooses a tier 1 perk from the officer which they have influence with and places one of their cubes into the slot. If you choose a perk depicting a red exclamation mark, you must pay one story or one valour, as depicted here as these perks are more powerful. For your first game, it's recommended that each player take the topmost perk from the appropriate column. Each of these perks is fully explained in the appendix. The overall structure of episode 2 is similar to episode 1 with players taking turns clockwise. On your turn, you first perform a primary action, placing a die and resolving various effects. Then you perform one of the possible secondary actions. Next, if you went on an adventure during your turn, you would resolve it now. These are similar to the patrols from episode 1. At the end of your turn, if any of your camps has been breached, you must resolve that breach now. This is indicated by the camp having your breach token underneath and you having a dino attack card next to your player board. In episode 1, you would lay down soldiers that were killed in combat. However, in episode 2, soldiers are immediately returned to your supply when they are killed. You still lay soldiers down however, but in episode 2 this represents that they have been used that turn and cannot be used again. So at the end of your turn, any soldiers that you have that are laying down are stood up again. Finally, just like in episode 1, if there are no dice remaining in the dice pool at the end of your turn, there is an assembly, during which players use their votes to gain followers. After an assembly, the dice pool is recreated and the game continues. The game ends after the third assembly or after the second assembly in a two-player game. You perform your primary action just like you did in episode 1. Choose an effect from one of the zones that you want to resolve. Then take a die from the pool and place it on an empty die space of that effect. 
Remember, you can choose any die, but if you choose a die belonging to another player, other than a dissenter, you lose two followers. And as before, you must place your die on a space with a matching icon if possible, and you can pay one story to change the face of the die. Unlike in episode 1, placing a die does not attract dinos, so that's good news at least. At the start of the game, you can only place dice into one of the four city zones. The discovery zone does not start with any die spaces. However, as outposts get built in the discovery zone, each of those has a die space which can be used. And they'll go through each of the various effects in the four city zones. In the sustenance zone, there are three possible effects. The pub works in the same way as episode 1. You gain one story, plus another story for each of your dice currently in play. The gather effect allows you to choose one or both of the options listed. Gain two globaries, and then either gain one food or one island resource. And or release a previously captured shieldhead dino to gain two globaries and one food. I'll explain how you capture dinos later on in the video. The adventure effect is a big one to explain. This is an evolution of the patrol effect from episode 1. To resolve this effect, you must first choose a camp to be your rally point. It can be any camp, even one owned by another player, but you cannot select a camp that has been breached, indicated by a breach token under the camp. Place the rally marker on the space chosen. An adventure has to start somewhere, so if there are no unbreached camps in play, you cannot choose to resolve the adventure effect. Once your rally point is set, choose up to two different options from the three shown here. Each of these options require what is known as a valid target hex, so I'll explain that first. Any hex which is adjacent to the rally marker is automatically a valid target hex. However, if you pay two globaries, you can select target hexes that are up to one cleared area away from the rally point. A cleared area is one where the map tile has been removed. So here for example, if you choose this yellow camp as your rally point, these two hexes are valid targets. But if you pay two globaries, then these three hexes are valid targets too. It's also important to know that you may select a different target hex for each of the options you resolve. And if you selected two different hexes, both of which are two spaces away, you only needed to pay the two globaries once. The first option to explain is combat dinos. Choose a valid target hex with dinos on it. The half hexes at the edge of the map may also be selected. So here, if you choose this camp, you could choose either here or here, assuming you didn't pay two globaries earlier. You cannot choose this hex as there are no dinos there. Then commit any number of your soldiers and or your leader to the fight. To indicate a figure has been committed to the fight, lay them down. The rules for fighting with dinos will be fully explained later in the video, but every dino that you defeat can either be captured or killed as shown by the iconography here. The second option is to clear the area. You can only choose this option if you do not currently have a face-up adventure card in front of you. To clear an area, choose a valid target hex with no dinos on it. So here, if you start from this camp, you could only choose this hex. If it is a plains or a canyon hex, remove the tile from the game. If you clear the area of the temple tile, do not remove the tile. The temple tile is never fully cleared. Then, play an adventure card from your hand face up in front of you. The type of card must match the terrain type of the hex that you're clearing, either plains, canyon or temple. And if you don't have a card in hand of that type, then you cannot choose this option. Clearing the area of the temple is the only way for you to play the temple card that you got dealt during setup. Ensure that you look at it carefully before embarking on this adventure. You must then assign at least as many soldiers as depicted in the top left of the card, from your player board to the card. You can use your leader as if it was a soldier. Anything assigned to the card cannot be used elsewhere until the adventure card is completed. If it's a stage 1 adventure, there is no need to place your stage marker, but if there is more than one stage, place your stage marker on the first stage. I'll explain adventure cards more later on, but they work in a similar way to patrol cards from episode 1, and they are resolved after you have performed your secondary action. The third option is to build a camp. You can only do this on a valid target hex that is already cleared and doesn't already have a camp. When you build a camp, receive the reward on the space that you cover. After you have finished resolving both of your two chosen options for this effect, the owner of the camp that you used as a rally point must resolve a dino attack. I'll explain dino attacks later in the video, but the important thing is that this happens right now, immediately after your action and not at the end of your turn. The rally marker on the board is a reminder of this. If it's on the board, you need to do something immediately after your action. 
In the military zone, there is only one effect. And just like in episode one, you choose three different options from this list. A lot of these are very similar to those from episode one. Gain one light soldier. Pay one food to gain one light soldier. Pay one island resource to gain one heavy soldier. Pay one story to convert up to two light soldiers into heavy soldiers. Gain one story or one valor. Release a raptor from your enclosure to gain one light and one heavy soldier. Pay one valor to take an adventure card from the offer. You can take any face up adventure card. If you take one from the top of the deck, a new one is automatically revealed. But if you take the other one, you must then move the top card of the deck to the now empty space. In the expansion zone, there are three possible effects. At the marketplace, you can choose to do one or both of the options. You may exchange one globary for two resources from the type shown here, food, scrap, or island resources. You can choose the same one twice or two different ones. The second option is to exchange any amount of resources shown in any combination. The politics effect is similar to that from episode one. Choose one of the following three options. Pay two food to replace a neutral die in the pool with one of your own, and then gain one follower for each of your dice in play. Or pay one food and one story to replace a neutral die that has already been placed on the board with one of your own and gain two followers. The third option is new for episode two. Pay two valor to gain two permanent votes and one normal vote. Whenever you gain permanent votes, you also gain a normal vote. So when you choose this option, you first gain two permanent votes, which also includes two actual votes, and then you gain one more vote. Votes work in the same way as they do in episode one, with the exception of the permanent votes, which I'll explain when I cover the assembly rules. The third effect is settle, which again is similar to that of episode one. Choose any two different options from the three shown. Pay one scrap and one food to place a settlement onto any empty settlement space in any city zone and gain the bonus that you cover over. Or pay one island resource and one story to place a settlement. Note, as shown at the bottom, if you choose both of these first two options, placing two settlements, they must be placed in different zones. The bonus for placing a settlement in episode two is either one influence on the officer for the zone, which triggers an officer's bonus if the influence spaces are now full, or gaining a perk with the officer. I'll explain more about perks later on. Also note that settlements can only be built in the four city zones. The discovery zone is way too dangerous. The third option is to gain followers equal to the number of settlements you have in a city zone of your choice. In the construction zone, there are two possible effects. To salvage, simply gain two scrap. The build effect is completely new for episode two. Choose two different options from the three listed. The first option is to pay one scrap and one island resource to build an outpost. To do this, choose one of the outpost tiles on offer and place it on a cleared area that doesn't currently have a tile on it, gaining the bonus of the space that you cover. Then place one of your settlements on the tile to indicate it is your outpost. Note, although you are using a physical settlement piece, this is not a settlement, it's an outpost. However, it does contribute to the population of the discovery zone, just like settlements do in the city zones. After building an outpost, replenish the outpost offer. The second option is to release a trampler from your enclosure to build a watchtower. To do this, place a watchtower from your player board onto an empty watchtower space of a cleared area in the discovery zone. Watchtowers help fight off dinos in case of an attack on a camp or an outpost. So it's usually best, though not required, to build them where there is already a camp or an outpost. And note that once placed, watchtowers don't belong to a specific player. After building the watchtower, you also get to take an adventure card as described earlier. The third option is to pay one scrap and one globary to build a camp on an empty space in a cleared area. This works in a similar way to building a camp with the adventure effect, except that you can build anywhere. You do not need to set a rally point or choose a valid target hex. As mentioned earlier, camps are possible locations for rally points when you are resolving the adventure effect. The discovery zone has no effects at the start of the game. However, once outposts start to appear, each of them has a die space which can be used. If the outpost has a breach token on it, it cannot be used as the outpost is overrun. However, if there is a camp in the same area that's breached, the outpost can still be used. When you place a die in the discovery zone to use the effect of an outpost, place the rally marker in that hex. Then resolve the effect of the outpost as shown on the tile. All of the outpost effects are explained in the appendix at the back of the rulebook. Immediately after resolving the effect, the outpost is then attacked, and the owner of the outpost must resolve a dino attack against the outpost. 
I'll cover dino attacks in detail later on. After resolving your primary action, it's time to choose a secondary action. There are five possible secondary actions available to you, summarised on your player aid. First, you can influence an officer. This is very similar to how it works in episode 1, with the exception that the cost to place cubes is now 1, 2 or 3 to place 1, 2 or 3 cubes. Like before, if all of the influence spaces become full, all players with at least 2 cubes on influence spaces gain the officer's bonus depicted here, and then all cubes are moved to the influence pool. The big difference with episode 2 is that when you influence an officer, you also gain one perk from that officer. I'll cover perks in the next chapter. The next secondary action to explain is placing your leader in a zone. This works in a very similar way to episode 1. You move your leader from your player board onto an empty leader space in any of the five zones, and then resolve any one effect in that zone. When placed in the discovery zone, this allows you to resolve the effect of any one outpost. Immediately after using the effect of an outpost with your leader, the owner of the outpost must resolve a dino attack on the outpost, in the same way as if someone had placed a die there. A new action for episode 2 is to spend two globaries to move your leader. This is essentially picking them up and moving them to an empty leader space in a different zone, and then resolving the effect of that zone as normal. The explore secondary action allows you to take an adventure card from the offer, and then take either two globaries, one story, or one valor. And the final secondary action is counterattack. I'll explain this more in detail when I talk about dino attacks. The officers work in a similar way to episode 1. Cubes are placed on their influence spaces, and when full, all players with two or more cubes on those spaces get the officer bonus, and then the cubes are moved to the influence pool. And during an assembly, each officer has a scoring condition which gains followers for the players with the most or second most number of cubes on the officer. The perks, however, are new for episode 2 and are shown on the bottom part of your player board. Each officer has six perks associated with them, divided into tier 1, tier 2 and tier 3. You can only gain a tier 2 perk if you already have at least one perk from that officer. And you can only gain a tier 3 perk if you already have at least two perks from that officer even if both of them are tier 1. Some perks are more powerful, indicated by the red exclamation mark. To gain one of these, you need to pay one story or one valour, as shown here. All of the perks are fully explained in the appendix at the back of the rulebook. And whilst the sheer number of perks might feel overwhelming at first, most of them are relatively simple. My advice when you're first playing the game is don't try to learn what all of them do, just pick some and see how they work out. After a couple of games, you'll get to know them. Immediately after resolving an adventure effect or an outpost effect, either as a primary or secondary action, you must resolve a dino attack. The rally marker reminds you of this. If it is on the board, it means you must resolve the dino attack before continuing the game. To resolve a dino attack, the player whose camp or outpost was attacked reveals the top card from the dino attack deck, based on the type of terrain where the attack took place, either plains or canyon. The top of the card indicates the defence threshold required to successfully defend against the attack. Below that is the various things that contribute to the defence. A watchtower adds two defence. Each camp and outpost in the area, no matter who owns it, adds one. And the player being attacked can spend valour to boost their defence on a one-for-one -one basis. If the defence threshold is reached, the player who was attacked gains the rewards shown on the card here. The card is then discarded. Phew. If the defence threshold is not met, the player who was attacked gains the failure reward, shown here, and then resolves a breach. To do this, the player whose camp or outpost that was attacked places the dino attack card next to their player board. You can only have one dino attack card at any time, so if you already had a dino attack card from a previous breach, return any dinos on the old card to the supply, losing one follower for each dino removed, and then discard the card. On the new card, place dinos from the supply as shown here. This icon indicates dinos from nearby dangerous spaces join in, in this case two of them. Look at the hexes adjacent to where the attack is taking place, including the hexes on the outside edge. The red bordered spaces are dangerous spaces. Take dinos from these spaces onto the card as required. You choose which ones. In this case, you're instructed to add two dinos from nearby dangerous spaces. So you take the trampler from here and another from here, removing them from the board and adding them to the card. Then place your breach token. If it was a camp that was breached, 
place the token underneath the camp. And if it was an outpost that was breached, place the token on the outpost tile. At the end of your own turn, if you have an attack card in front of you, lose one follower for each dino on it. Then, if there are at least two dinos on the card, remove one of them to the supply. Finally, after resolving a dino attack, whether it was successfully defended or there was a breach, you remove the rally marker from the board. So, how do you get rid of an attack card and take back control of your building? If you remember earlier in the video, one of the possible secondary actions was counter-attack. This action allows you to fight the dinos. It's important to know that a counter-attack can be performed by any player, not just the player under attack. For example, if you performed an action that caused a breach at one of my camps, but then you or another player counter-attacked before it was my turn, then on my turn, everything is back to normal. I'll explain fighting dinos in more detail in the next chapter of the video, but a player who performs a successful counter-attack and removes all the dinos from the card gains the bonus printed at the bottom. Then the card is discarded. There are two ways in the game that you can get into a fight with some dinos, as the result of the adventure effect or when performing the counter-attack secondary action. The process is the same for both. First, lay down any number of soldiers and or your leader on your player board to indicate that they are committed to the fight. They cannot be used for other actions this turn. Then, add up how much damage you deal. Light soldiers deal one damage, heavy soldiers and leaders deal two damage. Next, assign that damage to dinos that you are fighting. It takes one damage to defeat a trampler or raptor, and two damage to defeat a shieldhead. The next step is to determine how many injuries you take from fighting. Tramplers inflict no injuries, but raptors and shieldheads inflict one each. You then assign those injuries to your soldiers and or leader. If you assign one injury to a light soldier, you may then pay one valour to cancel that injury. And if you do, you cannot assign any other injuries to the same soldier during this fight. If you do not pay the valour, the soldier is killed. Return them to your supply. You may assign up to two injuries to a heavy soldier, but whether you assign one or two injuries, the soldier is killed. You cannot save them with valour. And your leader acts like a heavy soldier, and you can assign two injuries to them, but they cannot be defeated. For example, you are carrying out the adventure effect and you choose the combat dinos option. You want to remove all the dinos from this hex so that you can then clear the area and play your canyon adventure card later on. Unfortunately, the hex is full with one dino of each type. The raptor and the trampler require one damage to kill and the shield head requires two, meaning that you need to deal four damage in total. You commit one heavy soldier and your leader to the fight, laying them down. Both deal two damage, which is enough to defeat all the dinos. The raptor and shield head, however, both inflict one injury on you. You can assign both of these to your leader, which are absorbed. Just a flesh wound. Once you have dealt with your injuries, you then get your rewards. For each dino defeated, you can choose to either kill it or capture it. If you kill it, place it back in the supply. This gains you one follower. Or you can capture it, placing it into your enclosure. By default, you can only capture one dino per combat. All your dinos in your enclosure must be the same type, and you can have a maximum of four dinos. Perks from the Chief Engineer can change these rules in your favour. After performing your secondary action, if you have an adventure card in front of you, resolve it now. These cards work in a very similar way to the patrol cards from Episode 1. First, receive all the rewards from your current stage. If the rewards depict challenge cards, draw them as per the rules for Episode 1. One card for each soldier, with your leader counting as a heavy soldier for this purpose. Then, for each challenge card chosen with a threat icon, roll the threat die and resolve as normal. Your leader may ignore one threat roll from a heavy challenge card. If your leader absorbs a threat roll, mark this in some way, as they can only absorb one threat roll per card, no matter how many stages there are. After gaining all of the rewards, if you are on the last stage of the card, the adventure is now complete. Otherwise, advance to the next stage, just like patrol cards in Episode 1, resolving a threat roll as indicated between the stages. The next stage of the adventure will be resolved at the end of your next turn. Note that if you didn't use your leader to soak up a threat roll when gaining rewards, they can be used to soak up the potential hit from a threat roll when transitioning from one stage to the next. And finally, to wrap up, shuffle all challenge cards back into their decks, and if the adventure was completed earlier, return your soldiers and your leader back to your player board. Keep the adventure card face down in front of you. It will be useful when scoring the Chief of Security during an assembly. 
Like in episode 1, an assembly is triggered at the end of your turn if the dice pool is empty. Most of the rules for resolving an assembly are the same as they are for episode 1, but there are a few tweaks. The population of a city zone is calculated the same as before, 2 plus the number of settlements belonging to all players. The population of the discovery zone is 2 plus the total number of outposts of all players. Camps and watchtowers do not contribute to the population. The first thing that happens in an assembly is to assign the assembly reward tiles to the players with the most presence in the matching zone. As per the episode 1 rules, your presence is based on the total number of pieces you have of your colour in that zone. Dice, settlements, your leader, camps and outposts. If two players tie for the most presence, neither player gets the tile, but they get votes equal to half the population rounded down. Here, yellow and blue both get two votes. And if more than two players tie, nobody gets anything. Here, all three players have two presents. Then, each player with a reward tile chooses secretly which side to use. These are slightly different than episode 1. The side that gives votes is the same, but the other side gives one asset and two followers instead of two assets. If you were to choose the votes side, the player with the second most presents gets either the asset or the followers. They choose. The counting of votes and the scoring of the assembly tile is the same as in episode 1, as is the officer scoring, except the officers now have different scoring conditions. The chief mate gives one follower for each pair of one influence cube on any officer and one perk from any officer. The chief of security gives followers for each of your adventure cards. The chief steward gives followers for each set of two settlements in city zones and dice in play. The chief engineer gives followers for your camps and outposts. The captain gives followers for each set of three soldiers in play, not including your leader, and a watchtower that you have built. Since the watchtowers are in grey, just look at your player board to see how many of them you've built. When wrapping up the assembly, make changes to the dice pool as described in the rulebook. These changes are summarised on the assembly scoring tiles, and if playing a two-player game, place one dissenter influence cube on each officer, triggering an officer bonus if all the influence spaces are now full. Also, after an assembly, place the three outpost tiles on offer to the bottom of the stack and replace them with three new ones. Put the visible adventure cards on offer to the bottom of their decks and place the new top card next to the deck so that there are now two new cards visible for each type. When resetting your votes, only reset them to the position of your permanent vote marker, rather than back to zero. Finally, for each hex, including the ones on the edge of the map, if that hex is adjacent to at least one cleared area, place one dino of the corresponding type on the first empty space following the arrows. After the second assembly in a two-player game, or after the third assembly in a three- and four-player game, the game ends and you perform final scoring. Each player scores followers for sets of dinos they have in their enclosure, as shown here. Finally, players score points for any leftover assets, as shown here. And that is how you play Perseverance Episode 2. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment, and do the same if you've got any questions about the game. Thank you again to Mind Clash Games for sponsoring this video, and to all of my Patreon supporters who help fund the channel. Until next time, take care, and thanks for watching.